Jean Piaget, the great developmental psychologist, he called the last stage of adolescence the messianic period, the messianic stage. Now, most people don't talk much about that, I think, because they're, they don't know what to make of Piaget's claim, but he was a real genius, Jean Piaget. And he said, you know, when, when you're making that transition from, from the group identity that you're chasing as a teenager to becoming an individual, you know, and that's not a journey everyone takes because lots of people just get lost in group identity, you're going to be looking for a pathway that's essentially heroic. And what that pathway should be is that you identify with your culture deeply, you are socialized deeply into the traditions of your culture, but you're also capable of transcending it. You know, so then you become a culture creator as well as a, as, as a disciplined member of culture. But young people need to be offered something like a, well, a vision of destiny in order to catalyze their identity. And we're very, very bad at that, except on the ideological front. And so the woke types come along and say, you know, the planet's a virgin the great father's a tyrant, you could be a hero if you just stood up to that. And the kids think, well, I'd like to do something important with my life. And so they're just caught into that immediately. But because it's a one-sided story, it's, well, it's an, a one-sided, a one-sided religious story is an ideology. And a great so, representation of that is what they've done with Greta Thornburg. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's so funny, you know, because I thought 10 years ago, I thought we live in the delusion of a of a disturbed 13-year-old girl. How did that happen? And then, you know, Greta Thunberg showed up and I thought, oh, well, there we go. Now we've got the, we've got the, the 13-year-old. I feel sorry for her, you know, because she was chased into this apocalyptic terror that we're trying to enforce on all our kids. And then you think about her position, you know, so now she's all afraid and her mother's facilitating that like mad. And then, you know, she announces her fear her neurotic fear, essentially, it's driven by negative emotion. And, you know, Macron says to her, oh, my God, Greta, you're absolutely right, and bows. It's like, what the hell is a girl to think? You know, because what right. she really wants is to freak out a bit and for someone calm and reasonable to say, hey, look, kid, you know, the apocalypse has always been on us. It's always the case that the future has the possibility of being dreadful. But, you know, we've conquered terrible things in the past and overcome massive obstacles and there's no reason at all not to assume that we can do the same thing that's a I, very important point well yeah it's so, it's such an important point because there's never been a time ever where everything was perfect that's for sure there's never been a time ever environmentally where the earth was stable no if, if you go i mean stable you know currently you can kind of like guess what the weather's going to be but if you look at like models of like thousands of years it's never been flat it's always been up and down oh, yeah. heats well, up the earth was freezes. an ice ball many times yeah, many times yeah so yeah yeah well randall carlson was saying there's been times in our like distant past where the co2 levels and the oxygen levels were so fucked up that we were close to losing all life on earth right right and then this can, yeah, this can well, happen. See, the, the, the antithesis to that is to believe in something like the paradisal, the intrinsic paradisal stability of well-balanced mother nature. Right. It's like, yeah, a bit, but no, not really. There's a lot of variability, a lot. And a of lot. course, that kind of variability, that's hard on people because you want a certain amount of stability so you don't die. Right. But, but it, it doesn't deny that human beings have an impact on this either. No, no. Well, this is why I like this is why I really respect Bjorn Lomberg, you know, because L L Lomberg's hard to grasp because he forces you to think complexly. You know, he says, yes. "Well, we don't have one problem, carbon dioxide, which is, you know, I don't even think it's clear that carbon dioxide is actually a problem, but we can leave that aside. That'll get me in trouble with the College of Psychologists again." But, you know, Lomberg says, it's "Look, a factor. you know, yeah, it's a fa it's a factor. Yeah, yeah, but there's lots of factors and God only knows what the most pressing problems that confront us truly are. When I, I wandered through the ecological sustainability literature about 10 years ago, and, you know, I concluded a couple of things. One was that the best way forward to a sustainable planet is to make everyone who's poor rich as fast as you possibly can. And that's not, Lomberg's yeah, position. Yeah, not too. to put limits yeah. to growth on, because right. it turns out if you get people above about $5,000 a year in average GDP, they start taking a long-term view of the future instead of scrabbling around in the dirt trying to get lunch, you know, and you're going to burn everything up around you to stay alive if you have to. Right. But if you, if you got a bit of wealth and now you can think over, you know, maybe a 20-year period, which is quite the damn luxury, 
then you actually start being concerned about, you know, the quality, the aesthetic quality of the local environment. And so I was so excited when I found that data because I thought, oh, this is so cool. It means that we could have our cake and eat it too. We could work really hard to provide cheap, reliable energy you know, at the lowest cost possible to the widest number of people worldwide. And the emergent consequence of that would be the whole planet would clean itself up. So that wouldn't that be great? Because we could make our goal the eradication of absolute poverty, which we actually done pretty good at eliminating over the last 15 years, but we could really make that a goal. And then one of the consequences of that, inevitable consequences, would be a greener and, and healthier planet. And then you think, well, why aren't we doing that? And <laughs> that's a question, all right. And I think part of the reason is... I've been trying to understand the driving ideas underneath this globalist utopian tyranny that seems to be developing from the top down. And I think it's driven at least in part by this religious vision that I already described, you know, that you have to construe culture itself, especially industrial culture, as the tyrannical father raping and pillaging everything in its way, which is unbelievably dangerous way to think, too one-sided. And... Uh, the, the, the idea that you have to impose limits to growth on people in order to have a sustainable planet. And that's allied with a view that probably stems all the way back to people like Paul Ehrlich in the 1960s, who really believe, really believe, truly, that maybe the planet should only have 500 million people on it, or a billion, you know, in relative poverty, or two billion, barely scrape and buy because otherwise they're going to be wrecking everything and you know controlled by some top-down authority that makes bloody well sure that no one's consuming too much and so when i look at ideas like that that first assumption you know the planet has too many people on it it's like i don't like to hear people say that because when i hear that i think okay buddy who exactly are you thinking about getting rid of right. oh well it's not like that it's like yeah it's like that it has to be like it, that. it is absolutely like that and so you know, it's easy to get all paranoid conspiracy theorists about the WEF, say, and maybe there's some utility in that. But, you know, I don't think anybody's sitting at Davos going, well, we, got, we got to scrap 7 billion people. But if the underlying narrative is the one I just described, you know, virginal planet, tyrannical patriarchy and rapacious individual, and you believe, well, we're overpopulated, like Paul Ehrlich has believed since really literally the mid-1960s, then... How is it not going to be that the policies that you craft stemming from that narrative are colored by the belief that there's far too many people? 